I'm here with Jack Johnson and it's uh, November of 2013 and uh, Jack I got my start in neuroscience right across the hall from you and uh, then one day you called and told me we should work on manatee brains so I wanted to start the interview by asking you uh, something about your background and can you give the audience a feeling for how you got involved in studying manatees and their brains I did a postdoctoral fellowship to learn neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin with Wally Welker. And Wally was making a determined effort to get representatives of all of the major subdivisions of the mammalian order, and the results of his work are now available online as brainmuseum.org. <clears throat> but in the course of this, there was a visitor from uh, Guyana who came and talked about manatees and how they were useful for clearing waterways and be and Wally decided well we've got to get a manatee brain uh, we finally got one thanks to Roger and uh, that's how so well, I should go on and say that yeah. um, I started my own brain collection because Wally didn't have any marsupials and I thought well that's something I can do because I wanted to go to Australia anyway and I had a gap year between the end of my postdoc and the beginning of my real job, which I've been at ever since, and I took that advantage to take a Fulbright to Australia to get marsupial brains, which I did. Now, give the, give the, uh, give the audience a feeling for the context here, because the Welker Lab and the Woolsey Group in general in Wisconsin were sort of the epicenter at that time, at least in the United States, for comparative neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, the whole thing. Uh, can you kind of... You know, these days we're kind of used to people being interested in these things in the neuroscience community, but there was a very different picture back then. There was, and this is due to what went on in the mind of Clinton Wolsey. He was brought from Johns Hopkins to set up neuroscience at the University of Wisconsin. He received his PhD, not his, his he had his MD, but he did enough work to claim as a major professor Marion Hines, who is famous now for her big long article that has the big atlas of the platypus brain. And following that, uh, Clinton Wolsey was an early disciple of um, who, who? Almost the second person to be recording from cerebral cortex. And he set out to use the method of evoked potentials to map cerebral cortex in humans and all the other animals that he could find. Mm -hmm. And so that was why Wally had gone to work with him, because he was sympathetic and actually encouraged comparative work in one of the first-rate labs in the country. My mentor in all of this was Clement Fox, who was my teacher in neuroanatomy, which I learned as a faculty member at another university, as long as I was at Marquette, where Clem was, uh, one of my uh, professor's classmates had said, as long as you're Marquette, take this course. So I did. And I decided, well, that's what I want to be when I grow up, and I'm tired of what I'm doing here. So, <laughs> And at the same time, Fox told me, NIH had this program of career development awards where they would pay whatever pay you were getting as a salary, as a faculty member, to get up to three years training in advanced fields. And so I asked Clem where would I go. He recommended three places. Wally Nauta's lab at Walter Reed, which uh, is an interesting uh, circle. Uh, William Wendell, who at that time was running a lab in Puerto Rico. And Clinton Wolsey at Wisconsin. I already knew Wally Welker, uh, which I've written about. When I was a graduate student, my professor, who was Ken Michaels, said I should read every issue of the journal in our field, which at that time was something called the Journal of Comparative Physiological Psychology, it's, oh, it's got a different name now. So I read it for a year, and I remember there were three articles in it one year, and I went to a kid to point out, these are the best articles I've ever read. And they were by Wally Welker. He says, oh, I know him. He, I was in a class with him. <laughs> uh, so, so when I was working at Milwaukee, um, Wally wanted some instrumentation that I had used on my PhD thesis, 
and Ken said, uh, oh, Harry Harlow was visiting at Purdue, where I did my grad student, and he invited me to visit his lab, because I was in Marquette. He said, as long as you're over there, take this piece of instrumentation over to Wally. So I did, and that's how I met Wally. That's how you met And th that's all history, written in history. It's available in a, mag in a, in a journal. Well, now, Wolsey, yes, you mentioned, got his MD degree. Did he have a perspective, um, you know, like many at the time did, that we would understand human brains better by studying the, the supposedly simpler brains of animals, or did he have a true zoological interest in mammalian diversity? I think he was a true uh, zoologist interested in evolution. Mm -hmm. He was just interested in all these different animals, like Wally was and like I was, and he collected people around the place that pursued those interests. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. It was the epicenter, mm -hmm. if not the center of this kind of work in the country, and an amazing portion of the people that work in it these days have their roots there for that mm -hmm. reason. So, you know, the, we, were, we started talking about manatee brains, but of course the Welker and Woolsey enterprise was, as you mentioned, well, as it's, broad it's, as it could be. It's, it's when this manatee was brought to their attention that we set mm -hmm. that as a goal to get a manatee. And then Roger threw another route, uh, went his way and came up at, here, a manatee brain, whoops, bing. <laughs> <laughs> So we started working on manatees, thanks to Roger. So, uh, how would you say that your view of mammalian brain structure, evolution, whatever you want to pick, has been changed or affected by what you've found out about manatee brains? How do they fit into your picture of mammalian brain evolution? One of the first things I found out about manatee brains was in the catalog of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, um, put together by Sir Grafton Elliot Smith, and there's another story, uh, where he had this big picture of manatee brains, he says, this is ridiculous, it's a lysencephalic brain, one of the largest brains among mammals, and very strange inside, and he voted it the most peculiar brain of all the mammals. Mm -hmm. And that was 1918, I think. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, what has changed my mind? Yeah. Uh, that made up my mind. Now, what, what will change from that? Not a lot. Mm -hmm. So, let me ask you a specific question. We, as you know, uh, rediscovered the Rendenkern, which are these little cell clusters that, you know, we have a hypothesis about what they're related to, but they look like the cortical barrels in mice to some. Now, the models. cortical barrels in mice were found by Clinton Wolsey's son, Tom who was home from medical school at Johns Hopkins, recording from mice, but he was aware of what Wally was doing, and he saw these peculiar formations and talked to Wally about them, and Wally said, you've got something there, and he pushed them, and that's the origin of barrels. And what year do you think that was? Uh... I know that was... Uh... Hmm, when was it? <laughs> I don't know. Late 60s, perhaps, something like that? Yeah, I had left for... I had left for Australia and came back in 1965. It was 66 or 67. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom didn't get the stuff out because he was a medical student at the time, just working for the summer. About two or three years later, I think 68, came mm -hmm. out with this uh, article. Yeah, And that's what got Lee Weller all excited and one thing after another. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, when you you know, when you do uh, the kind of work you do, um, obviously there's a lab component where you're processing brains and... There used to be. I, I, well, I'm thinking about I've, your career. I've, I've not done know. that for 25 years yeah. now. <laughs> well, maybe you can talk about the process of, um, you know, uh, what it's like to go to meetings and exchange ideas and hear new ideas and new data from other people for those that might not have had that experience before. What, what do you get out of... Uh, these kind of interactions with your colleagues. Mm. Let's say that you went to an awfully good kindergarten. Uh, this is a way of repeating the experience every year. <laughs> all these new wonderful things that mean so much to you. Uh, all your old friends are there too. What, what, what better friend of a party could you have? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I go to a meeting like this and rewrite all my lectures for the, except I don't lecture anymore, but all my classes for the uh, coming here, mm -hmm. what I learned at, at these places. I, I, and I'm busy taking notes now for next year's edition. I say I don't lecture, but I have other ways of teaching. I think lecture is a lousy way to transmit information. Mm -hmm. And I have supervisors that feel that way too. 
Tell me, tell me more about that. What's your alternative way that you like to uh, well, lead a group? S. Job Dewey or Maria Montessori, they both do this. hundred years ago, you learn by doing. So we have people, well, Harry Harlow's philosophy was, he ran a laboratory where things, interesting things were going on, and students would come to educate one another. Mm -hmm. while there. Mm -hmm. And our medical schools work that way too. We depend a lot on, more on students educating one another than um, how things are turned into me. The College of Human Medicine, which is my home college, has a new curriculum coming out where I hear they are eliminating all big lectures. Mm -hmm. Not a moment too soon. Mm -hmm. They meet in small groups, have problems. It's problem-based learning carried to the nth degree uh, right from the day you get into medical school. So, so you're going and doing things mm -hmm. with uh, in an educational manner, controlled I and mean, tested, evaluated, all of this. But you don't sit all day with gaping and falling asleep and skipping class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So have you found in your experience of uh, engaging in that kind of a learning process that uh, it requires more faculty and more time, or is it, it does. just the way you do it? Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. They figure out how they're going to finance this. At our university, that's why I haven't started it this year. The way they expected it's two years off. Mm -hmm. But I, I certainly hope they will. So, if we could shift gears a little bit, and um, keep in mind here that our target audience is kind of like high school, maybe undergrad. Especially then. Yeah. Uh, this all started with my high school course in biology, which the teacher there was a genius and did. We did things all year. We never sat in class. Mm hmm and we learned evolution at first hand out in the woods and uh, mostly in the woods but other places catching bugs and whatever and hauling them in and going through the books when necessary to see what they were and how they got that way. Well I certainly have fond memories of your vertebrate neural systems class as a which grad student on my which that's what we did. Freshman we, class in we did, we did things. We, we cut brains and looked at them. So when you think about, you know, your career and the things that you've been involved in, um, can you talk about how science and the engagement in this learning process that you're describing fits into what one might call the larger goals and values of one's life, ethical values, your moral stance, and, and other values that you kind of hold dear, um, just being a human being trying to live a good life, uh, how, does, how does this career that you've chosen and this work that you've chosen to do fit into that larger view of your life? Um, don't believe what you read, see it for yourself, and always be very honest about what you see. And uh, treat everything that you do see as you would want to be treated yourself, that's the ethics of it all. So you're talking about truth-telling? Is that what Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. Yeah. Science is nowhere without that. Mm -hmm. And truth-telling, how do you know what the truth is? It's not what somebody told you. It might be, but you've got to go poke and pull and push and look and see and pick up the rock and look under it before you mm -hmm. can accept what you're told. You know, it's we've just come through a couple of days of meetings here, and it's always interesting to see the uh, tension between what an outsider might view as arguments, but what I think those of us that have been in the field view as just the normal discourse, the struggle. Um, it's a struggle more than it is an Ken argument. Ken Michaels had a wonderful example, which was Georg von Wickersheim, who won the Nobel Prize in 1961, I believe, for his book, Experiments on Hearing. And in his preface, he says, you'll never do any good in science unless you have enemies, <laughs> because they will find all the flaws in your argument, they'll do your experiments over, and they will really do all the work that you should have done yourself, but it's good to have somebody else do it for you. <laughs> and if you have an enemy, a dedicated enemy, cherish them for all their work, <laughs> because they invariably, and better later than sooner, turn into friends and they're no good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so good. yes, argumentation. Oh, I think um, Plato knew this. And that's why he could have all his uh, things that have been educated people ever since in the form of arguments. So, um, 
for young people that might be thinking about going into a career that's along these lines of science or working with marine mammal brains or anything like that, can you give us a feeling both for difficult challenges that you didn't anticipate that you had to deal with in your career and also unanticipated rewards that came your way that were a, a source of uh, pleasure that you didn't anticipate? Can I? What difficulties did I ever have? Darn few. Uh, one thing I, when I first visited the Lowy, he showed me he had a kinky to do in a cage. Because that was the animal that was up next. And I thought, you mean just go get one and do it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he did. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> Don't wait for somebody to say so. And uh, I've had three other experiences in life which aren't really relevant to that. But the point is, um, Well, I suppose my most recent chairman, who sadly had to retire last year, is, uh, rules are there, they're nice, uh, but they're there to be broken, and you have to know when to and when not to. And uh, the other things I've learned, I've gone to the authority and question, uh, what should I do about this, what should I do about that, and the answer I got was, you've got a head that ought to be worth something that we hired you for, figure that out for yourself and do it. <laughs> uh, don't, don't ask, just figure it out yourself and go do it and wait till somebody stops you. So this is reminiscent of the, the maxim that it's easier to uh, ask forgiveness than to get permission. Is that along these lines? Usually, if you know what you're doing, you're so delighted that they didn't, you did it, and you, whether you thought of it first or they thought of it first, have your own ideas and uh, Follow your own curiosity is what it is. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes to satisfy that curiosity. This was Wally Welker's secret. He was so angelically curious about anything, and he'd do anything to satisfy the curiosity. <laughs> did. That's science. Any mm -hmm. scientist, that's true. Mm -hmm. So let's elaborate on that a, minute, uh, a bit. I've got a, a question that uh, I'd like to pose to you. Uh, you know, when we think about doing science, everybody's always so smart and analyze things this way and that way. If you think about, uh, you know, life in general and how what we do in science relates to how we live our lives, how would you personally, you know, compare the the concepts of uh, wisdom and intelligence. What does that mean to you, if anything? Well, intelligence <clears throat> is uh, possession of a lot of facts. Wisdom is knowing what to do about them. Hmm. Intelligence is um, a bunch of information, or organization and all that. Wisdom <clears throat> is in <clears throat> decisions about doing. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that, you know, many people in science, I include myself, have difficulty with is that we're interested in so many things that we we have to pare it down and set priorities and, and, and that's... Um, the less that's true and it's, that's the big difficulty in my life. <laughs> and uh, so often Your priorities don't matter as long as you have one and do it. Uh, I think Ken Michaels told me that too. It doesn't matter what your decision is, just decide and do it and then things are going along. You'll figure it out as you go along, kind of, yeah. And I have, uh, I expressed this philosophy to Martin Balaban once and he thought it was the greatest thing I ever said. <laughs> no, the second greatest thing I ever said. Um, <laughs> this was that uh, I believe in freedom through overcommitment. <laughs> You have to do 87 different things today. Do the one you feel like doing. <laughs> you can't do them all anyway, so pick one. Another, another thing I learned from Ken Michaels, I had this big worry, oh, I've got to do this, 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 and he looked at me, and he had a way of looking, just putting his eyes right through my head, and what happens if you don't? <laughs> That's a good way to make a choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the consequences. Yeah. So, uh, again, along these rather philosophical lines, 
One of the that things. That was a philosophy major, by the way. So. Well, philosophy? Mm-hmm. Undergraduate major was philosophy. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we discover in science is that every time we think we've answered a question, to some extent, we've raised about ten more. Oh, yes. Which... That's, <laughs> that's the progress of knowledge. Um, any bit of knowledge leads to realization of ignorance about more things. So don't worry about everything being known. It never will be because the more we know, the more it is known that we don't know. Astronomers know this. Anybody who works in any kind of science knows this. Identifying the questions is two-thirds of the job. And answers to one question are going to raise a lot more. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a strange thing. Because it's an explosion. We, we get, we get uh, more ignorant as we age because we learn more things, but we, we, we learn how deep the darkness is at the same time. It and that's reasons. knowledge itself, and it's valuable it knowledge. It is. Uh, yeah. Don't feel bad about it. Feel good about how far you've gotten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm going to think of all the light that's around now. I remember teaching basal ganglia. Here's a big chunk of the brain. We have no idea what it does. That wasn't that long ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And wow, we learned, we learned a lot a lot about what it does. <laughs> so, shifting gears again, thinking about you know the younger people out there that might be considering going into a career, looking at some of these issues, uh, whether it's manatee brains or other brains or brain evolution, any of these things that kind of relate to the trajectory of, trajectory of your own personal career. You know, what sort of suggestions do you have, other than the ones you've already given, for somebody that wants to, um, say, study the brain and its relationship to behavior? Is there anything that, you know, you see out there that you would recommend a particular kind of attitude or, or set of things that somebody should really attend to that's starting out? In this? Yeah, I have a young lady working for me cleaning, and she started school, she had to write an essay about something, and she wanted to know what you should write. I say, write about what you're thinking and what you want to say. Do what you think you want to do right now. Follow your own instincts. Um, your instincts are important, wherever they came from, wherever they are. You've got to live with them. So if you let them have the day, and again, do what you feel like, as long as it's not uh, harmful, and especially if it's productive. And even more, especially if you make some money doing it. That, <laughs> that, and if you make some money and have fun doing it, well, yeah, you got it made. <laughs> I, I had it made from the word go, so I, <laughs> they pay me to play all day. Yeah, and they have been doing it for fifty years. Well, you know, one of the things I tell grad students or people that want to be grad students is similar to that. I say, well, you've got to have burning desire and follow it, you know, because that's what's going to see. It doesn't have to burn. <laughs> <laughs> it just has to be there. So to, I'd like to do that. Do yeah, it. motivation. Yeah, the burning will come sometimes. Oh, hey, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, other than things like the basal ganglia and the increase in knowledge, if you think about the academic environment for research scientists these days, how how would you say it's different than when you came up? What what for for the beginning young investigator? What what sort of challenges or big factors do you see that are different than when you were in this position in your career? Um, I belong to the blessed generation. I was born in 1931. This was the depth of the depression, and no one else was being born, so I was the only one. So I could do what I wanted. Uh, the generation just ahead of ours wasn't through this big crowd there, a lot of competition, that made tight life rough. But new people now, it's little down again. There aren't many of you new young people, and you've got a great opportunity again to uh, do what you like, but work at it and have a critical attitude, acquire some enemies, fight with them, and uh, you got me. <laughs> intellectual enemies, I should say. Yeah. yeah. If they're personal as well as intellectual, they sometimes do a, better, do a better job. So when you think about, you know, mammalian brain evolution, and you think about it in the context of all this incredible diversity that we see in existing mammals today, and then you, you know, sort of shift your focus to just thinking about marine mammals, is there anything that particularly sticks out for you about marine mammals that's striking, uh, strikingly different uh, in terms of brain evolution and, and well, the issues. They, they live in the water. 
Mm -hmm. Life is different there. Mm -hmm. And you talk about marine mammals, you put them on the tree that we know genetically what it is, and they're all over the tree. It's, a, it's an ecological division. Here's what you've got to do if you're going to live in the water. But all the different ways that they've gone about doing that gets very interesting. Mm -hmm. You can do it this way, you can do it that way. They all have to do this the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have uh, echolocation experts, we have tactile experts, mm -hmm. all, all uh, navigating. Some uh, animals live in pretty places, and it's nice to go there to work on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's reason enough. <laughs>